it's just a moment. We, well, we, you know what? I'll tell the story. We're, we're union. union. We're I, union. You're union. Alan, aren't you going to help us? No, you got to get the car home. Alan, come on. All right. Okay. Well, I have a friend. Every time I call his office in Greensboro to see how he's doing, his dad would answer the phone. And I say, Mr. Adams, how are you doing? He would say, I'm one day closer home. And he said it faithfully over and over, year after year. And one day I said, that sounds like a song. And I'd say, that sounds like a song. I went to his granddaughter's wedding, walked up to his table, and I said, Mr. Mr. Adams, how are you doing? He said, I'm one day closer home. He said, you've been telling me that for years. When are you going to write a song? Well, that very next week, guess what happened? I ain't looking, I ain't keeping. No, 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 not that one. <laughs> but one day closer home. You ready? Are you going to do an intro for us?
and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them lives, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. First of all, you know, we pass a lot of churches coming from the lake to this church. We pass a lot of churches. Some of them, I'm not sure they're still open. But I wonder how many of those churches that are open are alive. And, and really are worshiping together and serving together and reaching into your community together like you are as a church. So this is a message tonight for each individual, myself included, to really take inventory. A tough lesson, but a, a message that I think we all need to hear, and I know I do from time to time. So that being said, I know that without the Lord I can do nothing. So let's pray and ask for His help one more time. Father, I love you. I need you. And I worship you tonight, and I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Control me, Father. Help me be a blessing and a help, and even a, a challenge to, to the precious folks here tonight. Lord, they're here on Monday night. I'm so thankful for them. I know that encourages Pastor's heart, encourages my heart. But the question we have to ask oftentimes is, why are we here? Why are we in church? Where is our heart? And Lord, I pray tonight that you'll help me to communicate what you've shared with me and how you've convicted and dealt with me in my own life. And so I commit this time to you, Lord, acknowledging our need and dependence upon you. And I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 You know, when you think about it and talk about first love, it's not only does this message apply to our relationship with Christ, it can apply to our relationship in the context of marriage. Maybe you've heard this before. I've shared it many times and about this young couple who just got married. And they were so in love. They just had a little two-room efficiency apartment, a bedroom, and then a combination living area, kitchen, one bathroom. And they were so in love, though. And they decided, and he decided, I'm going to take you out for dinner. And we're going to a fine French restaurant, Hard Eggs. That's where we're going. And we're going to have a great time together. And I'm going to spend everything I can. And you get to pick whatever number you want as long as you get water to go with it. Okay? And we'll be here, all right? And we're going to have a great time. And she says, well, honey, it's going to take me a few minutes to get ready. And how does he respond? Well, sugar, butter. I don't care. I don't see how in the world you can, you can improve on perfection. But if you feel like some more can be done, I'm going to be out here in the living room and waiting for the love of my life. I'll wait all night if I have to. You have to wait for you all my life. I can't believe we're married. We're here together. I'm going home here. We're going to go out. I'm going to bring a can and put it on the table for us. At our day. We're going to have a big night together. You just take your time. He gets out the Sports Illustrated. And he's reading. And he's just singing and whistling. How you doing in there, baby dog? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm taking so long. You just take all the time you need. I've got the whole night, and it's all yours. I'm yours, you're mine. We're together for all time. This is just wonderful. And and then he finally comes out, and she's kind of a little frustrated. She says, Sugar Plum, just relax. We're not in any hurry, baby dog. We're not in any hurry. And they go outside, and just rained that morning. And when they went out the little path leading out to the car, there was a mud puddle there. He said, Princess, <laughs> Princess. We gotta walk around this. You watch your pretty little self here. We want you to get that pretty, pretty. Your clothes all sold to you. And he, he opens the door for her and he puts her little, little. And you and get your purse in there, honey. We want to drive that down the road. Come on, darling. And we go. They go all singing, happy and love. First, just so. Five years pass. Five years. They've got a bigger apartment now. He got a promotion at work. And tonight they're going out to the steakhouse. Where is he? He's in the car blowing the horn. Where in the world is that from? I'm telling you, I've been, I've been working all day. I told her to be on time. I told her we got to get a I got, I got a reservation for it. I can't wait to get that to my It's going to make my tongue snap. My brain down. I'm so hungry. I'm about to starve. I said, where in the world is that woman? And she comes, comes out the front door. Her purse is bouncing off the steps. Her jacket's half on. Her hair's not quite fixed. 
face like she wants to I'm coming. She comes to a mud puddle and a synapse in her memory <laughs> comes to mind. Five years earlier, there was a mud puddle. Darling, there's a mud puddle. Jump it, woman, let's go. I'm starving. Come on, let's go. <laughs> what in the world is happening? <laughs> Some of you are laughing. That really is close to home. We can have an invitation right now. If we did, I have to be down here first. I'll you later. And, uh, but, you know, as we get, think about our relationship with Christ, what can happen over time? How are things in your relationship with why are you here? Are we here because of desire or duty? Um, because it's expected of us? Why do I serve him? Why do you serve him? We're all prone to wonder. Now look, I've had seasons of dry seasons in my walk with Christ. I, I get that. When I was dealing, in fact, we're going to talk about how you deal with difficult people and when your faith is really being tested. I hope it will be a, a help to you, but... Have you ever experienced first love? That's the first question. And do you still have that first love for Christ? Can you remember what it was like the moment you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Can you remember? There wasn't no jumping on that day, was it? It was jump in. Yeah. And I'm all in and I'm so excited. <laughs> I remember personally yeah, how excited I was and I didn't understand it all, but I felt like this incredible load had been lifted off of my life and it had the guilt of my sin, the penalty of my sin, the power of sin had been broken in my life and now I had power to say no to things I could never say no to before. And here we are to this wonderful church in Ephesus that Paul had been ministering in over 30 years earlier. A church that, that, that was an incredible church. It was, in, it was started in an area that was absolutely in a, a, a metropolis. There were 250 to 500,000 people living in this city. It had an incredible amphitheater. I have pictures where they could see 20,000 people. It was a harbor town. It was, it was beautiful. There was marble statues all the way to the harbor. It was just glorious. Had a huge library. It was the primary harbor and it was the primary province of Asia. It was a religious and commercial center. It was home to one of the seven wonders of the world, the Temple of Diana. Yes, temple prostitution was a part of their worship in that pagan city. It was full. It was full of immorality. It was a cesspool of iniquity and perversion and demonic darkness. And yet Paul came and planted a church in that place. Who's your pastor in your church at Ephesus? Oh, Brother Paul. Well, who's your pastor after Paul left? Oh, Brother Timothy. He's Paul's protege. What a church in a hard place. What a church in a hard place. Who is the head of this church? Remember in Matthew 16, 18, the Lord says, I will build my church. Amen. This church. Our home church. Who does it belong to? It's his church. I know I say, come in, I want you to come to church with me. Come to my church with me. I know I say that, but the reality is, this church, every church, every Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church that stands on the Word of God is his church. Right. Every precious soul who's ever trusted Jesus Christ as Savior is his child, his daughter, his son. We read in verse 1, He that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. And these are not fallen stars, friends. These are fixed stars. We see his omnipotence. We see the omnipotence of God. And we see the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The word angels in the Greek means messengers. Many believe, and I believe this is true myself, that these are the pastors of those church churches. And um, the truth is, the church will never fail. The Lord says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Every church has problems. It's because, you know, the Exeter used to be a perfect church until I jumped in. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, perhaps not. But everybody is perfect until you get to know them. You know, we all have problems, we all have struggles, we all have difficulties. You know, if somebody tells me they got it all together, I can't have fellowship with them. I, I, I can't relate to them. Because I don't have it all together. I'm a work in progress. We all are in Christ. Now, I'm preaching to believers mainly tonight, but there's a message here for the unbelievers. And then we see His omniscience, we see His omnipresence. The omnipresence of Jesus Christ, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. The most important person here tonight is a person we can't see. We're two or three together. He said, I'll be in the midst. Yeah. Christ is here. 
He's here. He's with us. He's in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And again, we see his omniscience in that he said, he said we see his omnipotence, his omnipresence, and we see his omniscience. I know thy works. <coughs> the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. So our outline tonight is simple in this text. What's right? What's not right? How to get right and stay right. Now that reminds me of another verse in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Here's my outline for that verse. What is right? What is not right? How to get right? How to stay right? Isn't that amazing? And here we see the word of God dealing with this precious church, his church, in Ephesus. Again, over 30 years have passed since this church began. By the way, when you go back to the book of Ephesians, that Paul wrote to Timothy at Ephesus, they were commended for their love. But if you go to Ephesus today, there's no church there. There's no church there. What happened? A church that Paul began? A church in his protege, his personal son in the faith, pastor, is no longer there. What happened? They lost their first love. Mm -hmm. And we look at what is right in that church. The Lord spent some time talking about that. He said, you folks are dying in. When I look at your church, he said, I know that works. I know your labor. That word means labor and undertaking. They would work almost to the point of exhaustion. Listen, friends, we're not saved by works. But faith without works, James says, is dead. We, Because we are saved, we work. Let your light so shine before men, the Bible says, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So works don't work when it comes to salvation. We're not saved by works. But when we're truly saved, we will bear the fruit of works. We will serve. I heard somebody say 20% of the people do, do, 80%, do 100% of the work in the church. It ought not be that way. We're all, as his servants, if we are truly children of God, we ought to find a place of service and get involved. But these people were workers. They were dynamic in their ministry. They really were. They were patient. We read about their patience. These were patient, hardworking, enduring, persevering saints of God. I know thy labor. I know thy patience. Wow. They were busy. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3 we read these words. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. Where were, where was the faith, hope, and love in the church at Ephesus, Ephesus at this time? We'll talk about that. So they were dynamic. They were doctrinally solid as a rock. He says, thou canst not bear them that are evil. They didn't put up with anybody that didn't hold to the word of God and the truth of the scripture. They, this was the church that had that big book burning party. Remember that? This is the church that had the bumper sticker on the back of their, their wagon that said this. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. This is the church that was a separate, passionate, and pure church at that time. They were dynamic. They were doctrinally right on the money. They were discerning. He said, Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne. This church exercised church discipline when it was necessary, which I call a rescue and restoration ministry. Yeah. I don't even like the term church discipline personally, but I understand the context of Matthew 18. And he even said in verse 6 about them, This thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Folks, these people were not tolerant of error or false doctrine or false teachers. They, this was not the politically correct cat crowd. This was the biblically correct crowd. That's where they stood and they were strong on their stand. And he said this. They were determined. Thou hast not fainted. My goodness, they have kept on keeping on. Somebody has been kept on keeping on in this church. Previous to these seven years, the pastor Rick and the city have been here. And I commend this church in New Year. So some of you have been here a long time and you're still staying by the stuff. You're one day closer home, but you're still working. You're still laboring. You're still playing. You're still singing. You're still doing everything you can to keep the church going forward and reach into this community and be the salt and light God's called you to be. What a church. 
And if that wasn't enough commendation, you know what he says about them? In verse 3, you did all this. You worked all, all so hard for my name's sake. You worked for me. You labored for me. So that's what's right. There's a lot of good things going on in this church at Ephesus, according to our Lord. This is the word of God that's been inspired and given to John, who was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Patmos, John was that special, close disciple of Christ who loved him so dearly and was exiled for his faith. But now let's look at what he says, what the Lord says to this church at Ephesus that's not right. What is right? We talked about what's not right. Nevertheless, <clears throat> have someone against them. For the vow has left thy first love. You know, it's a bad thing when a spouse or a friend or a daughter or a brother or a sister has something against us. But friends, when God says, I've got something against you, that takes that to a whole nother level. What do you say? It really does. Some might respond, what is he talking about? How can he say that after he was so commendable to this church? You know, it reminds me of my dad. My dad, um, years ago, he had an aneurysm, a heart aneurysm. The week before it happened, which they thought he was going to die and he didn't, um, he had gone to the doctor and said, you're, you're doing great. You're strong as a bull. One week later, some of you know stories like that. So how's your heart tonight? How's my heart tonight? Not physically speaking, but spiritually speaking. You know, um, sometimes... We're in trouble, we don't even know it. Sometimes we've left our first love, we don't know it. I heard a story about a grandma and a granddad who were riding in a pickup truck, and they, she, he was here, she was over here, and they saw a newly married couple, like we talked about earlier, who had just gotten married and had all the bells and whistles and the cans and the noise, and, and they were sitting so close together, you couldn't tell where he stopped and she started. I mean, they were just, just like that, you know? They were in love, they were newly married. And the grandma looked over at grandpa and he said, she said, you know, Father, I remember when we, we used to sit like that. And he looked back at her and he said, well, I ain't moved. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, folks? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he never moves. Amen. And how many of you can say with heads up and eyes open, you know in my personal walk with Christ, there's been some seasons in life where I've moved. Anybody like that here with me? Anybody with me on that? Aren't we all prone to wander in our hearts? Aren't we prone to wander? Isn't that a part of this sin nation we deal with? You know, the furnace was still there in this church, but the fire had long gone out. So what is first love? We better define that. It means first. That first means principal, chief, first in rank. The word love there is agape love. It's God-like love. It's a fruit of the spirit of a fruit of the spirit of God in a purpose, person's life. You know, I read something, and this is a Newsweek article about Sylvester Stallone. Some of you have no clue who he is. I know a lot about this guy, Rocky, and I don't know where it goes. And he said this, and I quote: "Sadly, it's, uh, he said the, the writer said Sylvester is trying to explore that new continent. He just turned 60. And here's what he quoted Sylvester Stallone is saying. You see billionaires who have everything, yet inside they're still the same lonely, insecure people. You think you've got it all figured out, but then you turn 60 and there's still this little hole inside you. You realize we're always going to be somewhat half full. That's Sylvester Stallone. That's Rocky, who by the world's definition has everything, fame, fortune, everything that it would take to be satisfied and happy. And that's sad. I believe he needs Christ. I really do. I'd love to witness to him. But you know, it's really sadder still when there are Christians who say that they know Jesus Christ as their Savior. The one who said, I'm coming, that they might have life and have it more abundant. I just read this morning in, in the Bible where Paul was talking about he was exceeding joyful in his afflictions. And I'm thinking only Christ can give a person that kind of heart. It was in 2 Corinthians. It's amazing. I think 2 Corinthians 8. You can read it. It was one. I'm thinking, wow, how encouraging is that? And in first love and relationships, we know what that looks like. Man, I still remember what it was dating Sam. I mean, I'd be with her for hours. I'd get home and I'd call her up. You know? 
I couldn't get enough. You know, I rode my horse eight miles in a hot summer sun bareback just to see her. And another day, I'll tell you the rest of the story because I don't want to get better tonight preaching. You know what I'm saying? And uh, there was a four-page letter in there saying that she loved me, but she didn't want to be with me. You know what I'm saying? Hey, I got the last laugh on that. I've been married 39 years. Hey, you can handle that, all right? And that's a story for another day. But, uh, and you know what? I have to say this. That was a good move on her part at that point in my life. She made a wise choice. I really believe that, okay? So, um, but first love, we know what it looks like. But what is it like in church? You know, sometimes it looks like, I know you don't do bulletins anymore, but when they were available, some people love their bulletin more than they do their Bible. I've seen people in church preaching, preaching, he's reading the Bible, reading the text, and they're on their phone looking at a text or sending a text or reading their bulletin. And he's reading the Word of God, the powerful, precious, pure Word of God, for, word of God, for which people have died on a stake for, for which people have been burned alive for, and they are interested. Or they're more interested, not in the Word of Christ, the Word of God, the Logos of God, but everything else. You know, more interested in lunch. Now, I'm going to tell you, that was a fine lunch we had yesterday. And if I'd known how good it was, I'd have preached 10 minutes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but uh, it was sure good, and the fellowship was sweeter, and it was just wonderful. And that dessert, oh my, I, I don't see how easy I get off track, okay? And then please pray for me. Some people are more interested in the music than the message. And I'm all about music. I love music. Music is a powerful tool. Music is an opportunity to worship. I love the way we started the service today with a song these ladies sang that reminded me that Christ is coming soon. He's coming soon. Am I ready? Is my heart right with Him? Right. So you see, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Mm -hmm. That's the real you. And that is the real me. Sometimes people are more interested in, in the game than in God. And church goes into overtime. I've seen people get upset. You know, the game starts it. Of course, now they got to even take it. It's a little, it's helpful for folks. And, and I do that too. But are you with me? I asked my Bruce one time, my brother, the one that was in there, the one when he got saved, and he called me from Nashville, Tennessee, lived up there almost 10 years. And I realized that my brother had received Jesus Christ as his Savior. And I was home alone. Thank God I was home alone because I had me a bad cost of tea. Let me tell you, I did. I ran around. I shouted. I hollered. I yelled. Then I hit my knees and I'd pray to get real reverent and spiritual. And then I'd jump up and holler and run some more. You know, and I still remember that. But I asked Bruce, Bruce, what was the evidence of first love for Christ in your life when you got saved? Here's what he said. I had a burden for the loss. And I cried. It seemed like all the time for him. I was overwhelmed with the presence of God. I was so hungry for his word. I couldn't even go to sleep because I wanted to read it so bad. He said, I kept falling asleep reading my Bible. I was alone. He was all I had. I didn't have a family then. None of my friends were coming around. I turned on the TV. I, the next day I called and said, come and get this cable out of my house. His clothing changed. His appearance changed. He got a haircut. He had hair down to here. Took him three times to go to, go to Barney Fife's uh, the floor to get his hair cut. Yeah, I mean, I'm not kidding you. Yeah, that's a story I wish you could hear it sometime. Here's what first love looks like. Now, I want you to encourage you. Take a look at your heart. Here's what first love looks like. A hunger for the Bible. Yeah. Not just on Sunday. Yes. A hunger and a thirst for the Word. You love the Word. You know that's one of the birthmarks marks of a Christian? A newborn babe's desire for the sincere milk of the Word. You know what David, a man after God's own heart, said? He said this, Oh, how I love the law. Amen. You love the Word of God. Amen. Have you lost your passion for the Word of God? How about a hunger for church? And to be in church. And I, I have to commend you. You're here on a Monday night. God bless you. That's so encouraging. Something good is going on here in this place, in some hearts here, and I realize that. But how far would you drive to go to church? I had the privilege to be a part of starting a church in South Dakota, Chamber, South Dakota. I honestly thought that I was going to be the pastor of that church and God was going to move me out there. I love the West. I was saved out west. 
But you know who God used to start a church in Chandler, South Africa? To a hard place. No Bible gospel preaching churches. He used nine steps. When I talked to her for the first time, she was 80 years old. She had been driving for 10 years faithfully to go to church. That's 75 miles one way wow. to go to church. For 10 years. Granted, the highway was struggling out there. Can you imagine 10 years by herself? Had a daughter who died of alcoholism. Had a lot of birds, but she loved Jesus Christ. She had been praying for the night I talked on the phone. She told me, I've been praying for three years. God would send somebody here to start a church. She started crying. She said, I think you're the man. I started crying. I thought I was too. She loves fellowship. She needs fellowship. She wants fellowship. How about witnessing? There are a lot of ways to witness. We can pass out a gospel tract. I'm going to leave some of these laying up here. I love giving this tract out. I helped a little bit write it. But this is my brother and Hank Williams Jr. And it's kind of cool to be able to say, hey, this is a, a track that my brother wrote some good news in trouble. And um, it's a wonderful thing. But you know what? How many people are willing to print a gospel track and put their picture on the front and pass it out everywhere they go? My brother does. He embarrasses me sometimes. <laughs> you know what I do when I travel with him? I just walk behind him. I don't have to witness anybody. <laughs> One time I was in the airport. I'm not kidding you. We the plane, we were down, going down the whole air, and I go and get a drink or something. I came back, and I saw a Catholic priest and a woman and somebody praying with them. And I thought, what in the world? And I said, that's my brother. <laughs> and I said, who's that? I said, I don't know who that is. And, uh, I'm not kidding you. He, he loves the witness. He has a heart. He hasn't lost his first love. When's the last time? We passed out of God's When's the last time? We got back in the barn and prayed for somebody that we love this lost. I'm talking to me. It's been too long, friends. That's why I call this message, Get Back in the Barn. Sammy Fry, I'm going to get back in the barn. When I saw that scene, I said, Lord, I'm under conviction. I haven't even preached yet. That's what I did. What's happened to me? I'm a little older. It's a little harder getting down. It's not hard to get down. The hard part is to get back up. You with me on that? And, uh, but I need to get back in the barn. First love is pretty obvious. You know what Hudson Taylor said, that famous missionary? He said, the primary qualification for a missionary is not love for souls, but love for Christ. Right. This past week, I mean, God, when we walk with him, when we love him first and most, the doors, the windows of heaven, he will open. I'm getting a hot dog at Chuck Wagon in Carthage, North Carolina, just the other day. My grandson's over here, and he, I embarrassed him. It's dead pocket. You just gotta talk to him about it, don't you? I said, Well, I'm a journey right here in You with me on that? Yeah, you know. So so here I am, and this lady says, when did she get her hot dog? She starts telling us her story about her daughter who's in rehab, and she starts crying. And I said, You mind if I pray for you? First of all. Amen. And God gave me grace. Not only to take a minute, she was so grateful. So thank you so much. With tears in her eyes. To pause, and life is so full, and life is so busy, it's busy. But when Christ is first, our first love, it's His schedule. Now look, I keep a list. I write a list. I love checking off my list. I am so bad. If I do something that's not on my list, sometimes I write it down so I can mark it off. Pray for me, okay? I've got a problem. I remember one day, I leave my house, and I'm walking, and I'm walking, and I'm reading my Bible, and this man pulls up behind me in a pickup truck. He didn't go to our church. I know it. He's older. He's retired. He's very well to do. And he he stops and I stop. He says, Sammy, what are you doing? You know, sometimes we ask some dumb questions. Don't we? I mean, what am I doing? You know? But I'm thinking, I'm thinking, what are you doing? You're not on my list today. You know? <laughs> you know? And he says, Hey, you want to go for a ride? I'm thinking, not on my list. I got a lot to do. And, for, and thank God. I said, okay. I jumped in the truck with him. I said, where are we going? He said, I'm going to look at a piece of rental property. That are, it's a house I grew up in. The rentors have moved out. I just got a good check on it. And we're riding along. And the Lord, in His goodness and in His grace, as I've been reading His Word, talking to Him out loud, walking down the road like a crazy man, maybe. And, and some would say, and God nudged my heart and said, ask me a question. I said, how? Do you need to talk to me about something? He said, Sammy. This is a distinguished, well-to-do gentleman. 
He said, I have been needing to talk with somebody about something for a long time. I've been a deacon in my church. I've taught Sunday school in my church. I've been baptized in my church. I'm a member of my church. I'm a faithful member. But I do not know if I'm truly saved. We go to his that whole house. We sit in the swing out front. And I open the word of God. And I share with him out of 1 John. How you can know that you're saved. In that conversation, that dignified man met with me on that front porch of the home place where he grew up and trusted Jesus Christ. Amen. First love. When we have first love, the windows of God moves us and uses us. It's so wonderful. We came home, we'd gone for two hours. We pulled up the driveway and sent her, had a purse and her keys. She was going out looking for me. <laughs> and she said, Where have you been? And Howard said, It's my fault. Sandy saved me today. <laughs> I said, Howard, we've got to work on our theology here just a little bit. Sandy can't save anybody. You know, you, he was baby, baby in Christ. And I told Sandy, I said, honey, you thought the rapture had happened. You were worried, didn't you? But anyway, I'm sorry. I, I like to laugh. I, I'll help pick up myself sometimes. First love. I was at Weston Elementary School. I was working with the school system that time. I was walking through the lunchroom. There's a young guy in my 20s, single. And I looked over to the right. And at the end of the table, there was a little, I just remember a little black girl sitting there with the cutest little ponytails, sitting by herself. She was probably third or fourth grade, maybe that old, I'm not sure. But she had her hands folded just like this. And she had her head bowed over her lunch by herself in a public school, in a public cafeteria. And I was so moved by what I saw, I stopped. You know what I saw? First of all, do not ashamed. I thought about the times when I'd be out with a group of businessmen. And I worked in the corporate world for 18 years. And I'm going to say my blessing. What do we do? We don't have to go in there. I drop my nap. You know, don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. No, the truth is, I'm too concerned about what they think. And uh, and I don't mean to say, hey, stop it. We're going to pray here, bless God. You're going to pray because I'm going to. I'm a man of God. We're gonna... No, no. I just think, you know, it's right for me to publicly thank the Lord, because I am thankful. And I want to be a testimony for him. Not to do it for show, but to do it because I love him. You know, first love is demonstrating the way we give. You know, when Mary and Bethany poured out that uh, high-priced perfume on Christ, there was only one person who groaned and complained about it. You know who it was? Judas. He was lost. He didn't have first love. You see, when somebody has first love, they can't give enough. First, they want to give themselves. You know what I was thinking about one day? I was thinking, well, what would I say? And what would you say if Jesus Christ stood before you and said, you know what? I'm going to give you anything you want. You can have it. Anything you want, you can have it. And I was thinking about that, chewing on that. I know what I'd ask for. Here's what I would ask for. I would say, Lord, here's what I want. You can do this. I want another life. But I want you to have every bit of it. Not just 24 years old and on. I want you to have every bit of it. You see, when we understand what Christ has given us, and we understand how much He loves us and how He sacrificed, sacrificed for us, and He says to us, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. It's not too much for us to give ourselves to Him. I've often said to teenagers, look, you see that offering plate that, that used to go around? You know what Christ wants? He wants you in the offering plate. He wants you. He wants to be your first love. Because when we love Him first and most, it, it helps. Because we make decisions and choices based on the security of that relationship we have with Him. So we see here, this church at Ephesus had lost their first love. So much more than what is right, a lot. What is not right, you've lost your first love. You didn't leave it somewhere, you lost it. So what do we do? How do we get right? We'll close with this. I'll be as brief as I can. Thank you for your patience. Have you ever considered this? In Romans 7, verse 4. We read this, Wherefore, my brother, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye she, should be married to another. We are, in Christ, married to him. Did you know that? Right. 
That's why he can say, the adulteresses, adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship with the world is enmity against God. We are his bride. Wow. And he didn't want us to lose our first love. So what do we do? We need to remember. He tells us in the text. Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence there are fallen. Sometimes we need to share our testimony with ourselves. If we have a testimony. Sometimes we have to remember. In my case, I remember God answered my prayer and gave me Sandra as a wife. She's a gift from God to me. Sometimes I remember that we were planning for a honeymoon and I didn't have any money and I had a sound system and I was riding down the road. I tried everything I could do to sell it. I couldn't find anybody that would buy it. And I cried out to God, Lord, you know who needs it. And the next breath, the name of a pastor popped in my mind. I got him on that line. I called him on the phone and said, I said this to him. I said, I got the sound system you're looking for. <laughs> he bought it. And we went on the honeymoon to the bomb. We never been back, but it's not a trip, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and the sound probably said, what? Why not? You know? I remember praying for my brother to be saved. I remember praying for two years, wanting and having this consuming desire to be in full-time vocational ministry. I was in the corporate world. And God heard. God answered my prayer. Remember. Remember those times in the barn. Remember how hungry you and I were for the word of God. Remember answer prayer. Remember that he deserves our first love. You see, Vance Havner said it this way. Sometimes we can be straight as a gun barrel theologically, but empty as a gun barrel spiritually. He says, remember. Then he says, repent. Get honest with God. Lord, I didn't realize it. I honestly have moved. I ain't moved, Jesus might say. But we have. Have you? Have I? Have we left our first love? So if that's true, we need to repent. We need to go to him. Go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I wasn't even aware. Forgive me. Help me. And then repeat. Get back doing the things that we used to do that kept us close to the fire. Get back in the barn. If that's prayer, that's prayer. Get back in the Word consistently. Get back to serving Him. Maybe we need to have a book burning party or a CD burning party or a flash drive burning party. I don't know. Maybe some things in our life we've allowed we need to get out of our life. Because God says, finally, brother, what sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure to be in your virtue and in your praise? Think on these things. Keep thy heart with all diligence, Proverbs 4 says. Because if we don't, we can lose our first love. Because things begin to take the place that only Christ deserves in our life. So we need to abide in Him. We need to be obedient to Him. He said, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he closes his text, I've got to stop, with a warning. If you don't, if you don't, he tells the church, I will remove thy candlestick out of this place, except thou repent. You probably know churches. They're no longer worshiping and singing and serving and ministering to people. In this county, perhaps, they've left their first love, God put out their life. There's no church in Ephesus today. And it was a powerful force for God many, 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 many years ago. You know what? What price am I willing to pay to be like Jesus? What price am I willing to pay to be careful that I don't lose my first life? You know, I thought about my brother-in-law. Uh, his name is Dee. And years ago, um, his left arm had to be removed at the shoulder due to cancer. It happened at Duke Hospital. Brandon, his little five-year-old boy at the time, went to his mother and said this. And, uh, or said to his dad, excuse me, he said, Daddy, will you bring your arm home so we can bury it? You know? I don't know, that's different. You know what he said to his mother? He said, when I get older, I'm going to have my arm cut off so I can be just like my dad. You know what I see there? I'll pay any price to be like my Jesus. Any price. <coughs> it's 25 after. I have five more minutes, folks. Are we good? I mean, what are you going to say? Sure. You know, you say no, you stop. Okay. What are you going to say? That's kind of foolish, right? Can I, can I have five more minutes? Just hang with me just a minute. Sandra and I were taking a couple out to dinner one night, and they uh, were Mennonite in their faith. 
she believed that you could lose your salvation. And um, I kept sharing scripture. I don't believe that at all. I believe once we're saved, we're always saved. And the word of God is clear to me, crystal clear. Yeah. She got frustrated with me. And finally, it's Maggie, and I love her here. We love this family. She's gone now. She said, well, why do you serve him then? Hmm. And I said this. Well, I hope and pray it's because I love him. Yeah. Why do you serve Jesus? Do you love him? Do you know him? And in closing, I read something that really expressed to me what first love ought to look like. Do you know Bailey's Jesus? The article began. God recently allowed me to see Jesus to the eyes of someone seeing him for the first time. Having the advantage of knowing how the story ends, we can quickly forget the cost of our redemption and the love of our Savior. Every year we attend a local church pageant at Christmas time, which tells the story of Jesus from his birth through his resurrection. It's absolutely spectacular, with live animals and hundreds of cast members in realistic costumes. The magic entered the huge auditorium where mamas from the rear descending the steps in pomp and majesty. Roman soldiers look huge and menacing in their costumes and makeup. Of all the years we've attended, one year stands out indelibly in my heart. It was the year that we took our then three-year-old granddaughter, Bailey. Bailey loves Jesus. She was mesmerized throughout the entire play. Not just watching, but involved as if she were a part of the scenes. She watches as Joseph and Mary travel to the end. She is thrilled when she sees baby Jesus in his mother's arms. When Jesus or a young donkey descends the steps from the back of the auditorium depicting his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Bailey was absolutely ecstatic. As he neared our aisle, aisle Bailey began jumping up and down, screaming, Jesus, Jesus, there's Jesus. Not just saying the words, but exclaiming them with every fiber of her being. She alternated between screaming his name and hugging us. It's Jesus, look. I thought she might pass out. Tears filled my eyes as I looked at Jesus through the eyes of a child in love with him, seeing him for the first time. How like a blind beggar screaming out in reckless abandon, Jesus, Jesus, afraid he might miss him, not caring what anybody thought. That was Bailey. Then came the arrest scene. On stage, the soldiers shoved and slapped Jesus as they moved him from the garden of Gethsemane to Pilate. Bailey responded as if she were in the crowd of women with terror and anger. Stop it, she screamed. Bad soldiers, stop it. As I watched her reaction, I wish we had talked to her before the play. Maybe it's okay, you're just pretending, I told her. They are hurting Jesus, stop it. She stood in her seat, reacting to each and every move. People around us at first smiled at her reaction, thinking how cute. <laughs> then they stopped smiling and began watching her watch him. In a most powerful scene, the soldiers lead Jesus carrying the cross down the steps of the auditorium from the back. They were yelling and whipping and cursing at Jesus who was bloodied and beaten. Bailey was now hysterical. Stop it, soldiers. Stop it, she screamed. She must have been wondering why all these people didn't do something. She then began to cry instead of scream. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. People all around us began to weep as we all watched this devoted little disciple. See her Jesus beat and crucified as his first century disciples had. Mm -hmm. Going back and forth between her mother's lap and mine for comfort, she was distraught. I kept saying, baby, it's okay. Jesus is going to be okay. They're just people pretending to be soldiers. She looked at me like I was crazy. And her life, her heart was real. In my lap, we talked through the cross and burial. Watch, baby. Watch. Look for Jesus. The tomb began to tremble and lightning flashed as the tomb stone rolled away. A Super Bowl touchdown chair couldn't come pl close to matching this little one's reaction to the resurrection. Jesus, he's okay. Mommy, it's Jesus. <laughs> I pray that she wasn't going to be traumatized by this event. But I shall never forget it. I'll never forget seeing Jesus suffering crucifixion and resurrection through the eyes of a little child. Following the pageant, the actors all assembled in the fort to be greeted by the audience. As we passed by, some of the soldiers, Bailey had screamed out, Bad soldier, don't you hurt Jesus. The actor who portrayed Jesus was some distance away, surrounded by well-wishers and friends. Bailey broke away from us and ran toward him, wrapping herself around his legs, 
holding on for dear life. He hugged her and said, Jesus loves you. He patted her to go away. She wouldn't let go. She kept clinging to him, laughing and calling his name. She wasn't about to let go 